Hi, this is Matthew Cratter from Trader University. And today I want to talk about the death of value investing, why these investment strategies don't work anymore. I'm getting a lot of questions, a lot of comments about Warren Buffett and also low PE stocks. So I thought I'd put this video together. If you want to learn what's working in these markets, what's not working, and how to make money in a bull or bear market, be sure to hit that subscribe button. So there've been a lot of high profile cases over the last five years very famous value investors like Bill Ackman, uh, David Einhorn, really underperforming the market. Some of these guys have had rebounds in the last year or so. Uh, I'm not sure how they're doing this year, but this has been, they did very well. This is a group of people who did, did very well in the early 2000s when the stock market bubble burst. They had a good run from about 2000 to 2010. Uh, they did well during the financial crisis, and then people allocated a lot of money to them, and they began to really underperform. And then obviously the really high-profile case, a lot of talk, especially in the wake of the 2020 uh, annual meeting of uh, Berkshire Hathaway, just taking a look at Berkshire Hathaway and Warren Buffett's performance over the last five years has been quite bad. And I, I would extend that and say it's really been bad since uh, since 2009, since the end of the great financial crisis. You can see here the red line is the S&P 500. So if you just bought a simple index fund, you massively have outperformed the blue line, which is Berkshire Hathaway. Now, the lifespan of value investing, I would put roughly, I would have it overlap with Warren Buffett's active years. He's obviously still, obviously still active, uh, but the, the two bookmarks I use for kind of the birth and death of value investing that I have in the title the uh, the birth is 1934, obviously the public publication of security analysis, this famous Graham and Dodd book. Uh, Benjamin Graham was sort of a mentor for Buffett, and then Buffett began to kind of move beyond him. But this is the classic, this is sort of the Bible of value investing. Now, Benjamin Graham came out of the Great Depression. He'd had a very traumatic experience. I seem to remember he lost something like two-thirds of his money in it. And so he came out very, very conservative. And like uh, like my grandparents, for example, people f uh, from this era of the Great Depression, he had a way, a certain way of seeing the world. So I would say this was kind of the birth of value investing, the publication of security analysis. And then the death, I would say, was when the Federal Reserve did its first quantitative easing program in the depths of the great financial crisis. They started in Jan 2009 and really initiated a, a 10, 11 year bear mar uh, 10 or 11 year bull market that we sort of have seen uh, sputter in the first quarter of 2020. Now, for those of you who haven't been following my channel, quantitative easing is just when the Federal Reserve or any other central bank, they actually make money out of nothing. They print a lot of new money. In practice, it's actually digital money. It's not actually paper dollar bills, but they print money and then they buy things with it. It's a nice power to have if we could all do that. If you or I do it, it's called counterfeiting. If the Federal Reserve does it, it's called quantitative easing. So they print new money and they buy things like government debt, treasuries, mortgage-backed securities, and they add it to their balance sheet. We can see how the Fed's balance sheet has just exploded from $4 trillion to almost $7 trillion just in the first uh, quarter of 2020 in the wake of the whole, the whole pandemic. Now, the Fed is also, in addition to buying treasuries and mortgage backs, they're going out the risk curve, and they're now saying that they can and will buy junk bonds. Now, junk bonds are very high yield bonds of risky companies. And if the Fed says that it's going to guarantee them, what it means is that these, these fairly risky companies have become less risky because the Fed will basically bail them out and save them. Now, Warren Buffett made a lot of money, uh, really positioned Berkshire in a, in a nice way during the last, the last financial crisis from 2007 to 2009. He was basically the lender of last resort. He, he um, lent, uh, lent money to Goldman Sachs. He also got uh, preferred shares. He did a bunch of deals in the depths of the financial crisis. But this time things were a little bit different and Buffett talks about it in his, the transcript of his annual meeting from 2020. He, was, he, talks, he says that a lot of companies, the phone was starting to ring. People were asking Buffett to take an equity stake or lend them money in their company in order to uh, provide them with some, some temporary liquidity. And the phone was just starting to ring and then the Fed stepped in with its quantitative easing, with all its new lending programs. And so this is why Buffett is still sitting on whatever it is, $140 billion worth of cash. He wasn't really able to buy anything this time around because the Fed stepped in in such a big 
way. And so this, I, I remember um, in 2000 and 2002, there were, there were still, uh, you could still sort of do on your own scale what Buffett does. So there's a company called Keynote Systems. It's no longer publicly traded, uh, K-E-Y-N. And I remember uh, being able to buy shares for $6 a share. This is a company, this is a tech company based in the Bay Area. They had zero debt, or basically zero debt. Uh, I, the stock was trading for about $6 a share, if I remember correctly. And they had $7 per share of cash on the books. So you were basically buying a dollar uh, for uh, less than less than a dollar. These kind of things used to happen quite frequently. Maybe in the last quarter, we saw something like this happen. I didn't see any real companies trading below cash, or if they did, they maybe only did for a couple of hours. Uh, now, if you buy a company that's trading below its cash value, what it means is it's probably self-liquidating and not a good investment. Now, here is a chart of this. This red line is the value, the Vanguard growth index fund ETF. The blue line is the value line. So what value investing, it means many things to many people. What it, what it uh, has sort of meant over the last 20 years is buying PEs, buying stocks that trade with a price to earnings ratio or PE that's below that of the market. These tend to be more old economy companies that are slower growing, these value stocks. And then growth stocks, the red line, will be companies that are growing their revenues fairly quickly, uh, even if they don't have any earnings, they trade at higher PEs, etc. So you can see really since the depth, this is since 2009, growth, as we all know, has just massively outperformed value. And there are a lot of people who think that things are going to change and all of a sudden value is going to catch up. We can see that it's not happening. This is not what happened uh, even this year during people have been waiting for a big crisis like the pandemic. But even this year, uh, growth uh, has been outperforming value. And we've seen that in the outperformance of indices like the QQQs, uh, outperforming the Dow and the S&P 500 because of these FANG stocks. Uh, that. So here's a great example of what happens today. Any stock that's trading a low PE, so this is Bed Bath & Beyond, uh, obviously sort of household stuff, uh, physical stores. I'm not sure what their online sales are, but they're really known for their physical stores. Back in May of 2020, the stock was very cheap by traditional value investing standards, trading at a PE of just eight. And I remember a lot of people asking me about this. Uh, and what happens now is that if a stock has a low PE, it's a sign that there's a problem with it. It's a sign that there's a problem with it. Just like if you see a brightly colored fish with uh, spikes, uh, it's, it's warning you not to touch it. And I view PEs under really under 15 in this day and age, certainly under 10 uh, and certainly under five as being sort of poisonous fish that you don't wanna, don't wanna touch. We'll go over some examples, but you can see here that tr traditional value investing did not work. What was happening is the market was pricing in uh, falling earnings, uh, loss of market share. And so the stock really moved from about 16, it's now trading at about six. So even if you'd bought it at a very low PE, if you thought you'd been very Buffett-like and you'd waited. Low PE stocks are really bad news uh, in this current current environment. Then we have sort of classic blue chip Buffett stocks like, like Coca-Cola. These tend to trade at slightly higher PEs. We can see that Coke's trading at a 12-month trailing PE of about 19. But these, these sort of conservative companies, uh, sort of your grandfather's blue chips, they don't trade uh, in this environment of low interest rates, they don't really trade based on a PE. They trade like bonds and they tend to trade. So for example, Coke trades at a dividend yield between about three and 4%. People are pricing it as if it's an equity bond. And so a lot of people don't really even pay attention to this PE and the market seems to price it as a substitute for a high, high interest uh, savings account or a treasury or something like that. And this is obviously a fairly slow growing company now. They're already a very big company, almost 200 billion. They actually have a market cap that's about equal to the, the value of all the Bitcoin out there, which shows you really how, how small Bitcoin still is. But these kind of stocks, uh, you cannot buy Coca-Cola and think you're gonna get rich like Warren Buffett. He bought it during its growth phase, actually, ironically. He bought it when Coke was just big in North America and Europe, and he saw it spreading to all the developing countries. And this was his really big insight. And so it's ironic that 
that that one of his most successful investments was actually a growth investment. I think he paid about an 18 PE for it. So there's this myth that Buffett always pays very low PEs, uh, but in fact, he didn't. He paid 17, 18 for Coca-Cola in the late uh, late 80s. And that's that's the PE, not the, not the stock price. This is a chart of the Scheller PE, which is sort of a cyclically adjusted uh, average of the PE of the S&P 500. And there's been a real secular change you can see since uh, really since the 1990s and the birth of Silicon Valley and modern modern tech companies. Before that, the Scheller PE was always, uh, it would spike above, it would spike above 20 in 1929 before the crash or in 1987 before the crash. I guess here, this was uh, Black Monday here. So it's kind of always below 20. You can see that for the last 30 years, it's been well above 20. We had sort of a crazy point at which it, it got very high in the late 90s, but it never really, and then we had a point during the great financial crisis where it briefly dipped below 20, uh, but you can see that PEs have sort of permanently moved to a higher a higher uh, plateau, and this, this is a measurement of the stock market as a whole, at least large caps. Now, part of the reason for this is that interest rates have come down since 1980. Uh, this is the 10-year yield on the U.S. Treasury around uh, 1981 it had a uh, you could buy a treasury and make 15 percent at least nominally and now treasuries have gone to zero this has been this has been uh, how the system has worked we're very late in the fiat system here uh, and interest rates now are very close to zero or even negative all around the world so what this means is when interest rates move down dividend yields also move down so even in the in the 1980s, you could still buy a good American company, a good stock that had dividend yield about, of about five percent or six percent, and was still growing. And you can't do that anymore. Now the S and P dividend yield is around two percent. I think it's a little bit below that. Dividend yields have moved down, and you can think of you can think of interest rates and dividend yields as, as being sort of the inverse of PEs. High PEs imply low earnings yields low interest rates, low, uh, low uh, dividend yields as well. Now, there are a number of reasons for this, which we'll, we'll go through. Uh, one of them is really kind of the hollowing out of the middle class. And I'll, I'll give you an example. What this means, the hollowing out of the middle class, it means that at least in the U.S., there used to be a much larger middle class. And the middle class has been disappearing over the last 20, 30 years. People have either been falling out of the middle class and moving into the working class. And there are a lot of things surrounding this, obviously the opioid epidemic and the outsourcing of all of our manufacturing to China, etc. And then you have people in the middle class who have sort of reached escape velocity. They pop up into the middle class, usually because they moved into working in tech or moving into finance. And so you've had this hollowing out. America was always this kind of big middle class for most of the 20th century. It's been hollowed out. And I'll give you a perfect example. We have Kraft Heinz. It's a Buffett, uh, Buffett company. I'm not sure if he still owns it. But you can look at this and see that I recognize all these brands from when I was a kid. Oscar Mayer and Jell-O and Velveeta, etc. Kraft Macaroni and Cheese. Some of these are still used. Uh, I still like Heinz Ketchup, for example. Uh, I remember all the funny ads about Grey Poupon many years ago. But there's been sort of a hollowing out of the middle class. And what this means is that instead of using Heinz ketchup, if you're rich, you use uh, Sabatino Tartuffi truffled hot ketchup, which is normally $17 for a small bottle. It's currently on sale probably because of the recession. So instead of buying a three or $4 bottle of Heinz ketchup, you pay 16 or $17 because you've got very sophisticated uh, tastes or you're sort of signaling to uh, everyone else how rich you are. And then the people who've dropped out of the middle class are buying the generic ketchup. They're, they the wages have not kept up with inflation, and so uh, if you're the working class, you have to be very careful, and you you want to you want to pay three or four dollars for Heinz ketchup or whatever it is now, but you buy Kroger. So this is the uh, the uh, the more upper class here, uh, the the finance people, the hedge fund guys, the the, the lawyers, uh, the central bankers, investment bankers, and then uh, working class. And so as a result. Kraft Heinz has not done very well over the last few years. And there's been a lot of evolution of brands. People aren't as loyal 
to brands. Uh, I think my parents probably used the same brands that, that their parents used. Uh, but when we, my wife and I were raising our kids, we were always looking for something that was organic or um, something, something a little different. And so I think that's one reason that the competitive moat around these companies has really been eroding away. People either go to the really high-end brands or to the more generic in-store Safeway, Kroger uh, bands, uh, brands. Obviously, there's the rise of high tech, especially the FANG stocks. I think in particular of Amazon and Google. If you're going to do use a search engine, it's almost certain that you use Google. These are monopoly companies that have not been regulated regulated by the government. There hasn't been really any antitrust movement against them yet. There may be coming, and they may be coming for Google. Something like Amazon has just been devouring industry after industry, and as a result. Uh, if you are trying to fight Amazon, if you're a Bed Bath and Beyond, you've been you've been in trouble. Or if you're a grocer, a grocery store like Safeway or Kroger, it's very difficult to compete with Amazon as it gets in the grocery business, buying Whole Foods, and uh, this sort of thing. This is a great meme. Yeah, if you could go ahead and do all your shopping through us, that'd be great. Obviously, Amazon. Now, what's interesting is Amazon. You know, Buffett always likes companies that have moats. What he calls an investment moat which means that it's very difficult to compete with them. Something like Coca-Cola, where there's, it used to be just the drink, the only drink company, and then obviously Pepsi came along as well. Uh, but these companies used to have uh, a huge competitive advantage, a huge moat like the water surrounding a castle, but you could still buy them at reasonable, reasonable PEs. We live in an economy because of the internet, because of globalism, where if you win, you win really big. It's kind of what they call winner take all. So Facebook, when Facebook won, it basically took the whole market. Obviously there's room for Twitter and Instagram, et cetera. But a lot of these companies, obviously Facebook absorb like, like, like Instagram. And as these companies have these huge competitive advantages and we'll, we'll even call them monopolies like Amazon, uh, very difficult to compete against a company that's content having 1% net margins even as they've done this, their PE has been very high. So here's the PE of Amazon for the last few years moved from over 200, but still uh, in the high 70s, high 90s. And this is not how companies have traditionally looked. So if you bought Amazon at a very high PE, you did very well, sort of anti, the anti-Buffett way of investing. And in many ways, Jeff Bezos has turned out to be a much better investor than Buffett. And I, I would say has contributed more to the world. He's obviously destroyed a lot of people's lives as well. Uh, that These things are always a mixed blessing when you have uh, something like a Death Star like Amazon that can just come in and blow up every planet that it wants to blow up. Let me give you an example of low PE stocks. So here's the FinViz screener. I'm screening for stocks that are have a PE under 10. This is how you used to do value investing. And you can see here that it's funny, actually, Berkshire Hathaway is listed here as a, when you have financial stocks, their PEs can be a little, a little wonky, Goldman Sachs, Berkshire Hathaway. But if we just take a random name off this list, you're always told you should buy low PE stocks. Here's the Whirlpool, Whirlpool Corporation trading at a PE of eight. Seems like a really good deal until you remember that this is a very secular stock. Uh, it moves with the economic cycle. It's very tied to housing. When the housing market's doing well, as it did, for example, during the housing bubble, people were buying multiple houses and they'd buy uh, washers and dryers and dishwashers for them. So they're very, this is a very economically sensitive stock. You can see that it also, uh, the revenues are kind of all over the place. Uh, in 2016, they had, the revenues are basically stagnant. They had 20 billion revenue in 2016, basically 20 billion revenue now. And they're, um, their net income has just moved all over the place. It was negative in 2018, and that was hugely positive. These are very difficult stocks to trade or invest in. And this is one reason the market is assigning it such a low PE. And there's a lot of, un because there's a lot of uncertainty uh, s surrounding it and surrounding, you basically have to be become very good at predicting the economic cycle in order to invest in a stock like this. So that would be one example. Here's a company that people are always asking me about, IBM, currently trading at a PE of 12, which is very low considering the S&P is a PE of above 20. People are very drawn to investments like this in the current environment, especially 
people in retirement or moving toward retirement or very conservative investors that want a good dividend yield. So for example, IBM has a dividend yield of 5.5%. This is amazing considering you get basically zero or 1% in your savings account. And so people uh, try to, people are drawn to these stocks, especially because they have these iconic names, AT&T, IBM. But I would suggest that these are sort of, these are sort of dying companies. These were my grandfather's blue chip companies, maybe my father's blue chip companies, but now they've been stagnant. Uh, IBM is trading at the same price, roughly that it was trading in the late 90s, if I remember correctly. And it's got this high dividend yield simply because it's not, uh, it's not sustainable. It's not going to be able to keep paying this dividend. They're not innovating the way they used to. Now, obviously, I don't know a whole lot about IBM. If you work for IBM and if you have a lot of visibility into the kind of people who work there and into their future prospects, obviously go ahead and buy it uh, if, you, if you really dig down and know how a company works. But if you just are a kind of a casual retail investor and you say, wow, f dividend yield of 5%, that's good. I, I'd rather earn that than 1%. And IBM, well, that's a really safe name. This is what Buffett was thinking. Buffett got killed in IBM. He sold it a few years ago. But you cannot, uh, you cannot buy your grandfather's blue chips. This is not a very exciting tech company, at least from an outsider's perspective. I'm sure there are brilliant people working there. Uh, but if you're really smart, if you're young, you probably don't go to work for IBM. You go, to, you move to Silicon Valley and work for uh, Facebook or Google or some some tech startup. So there's there's, it has that working against it too. If, you, um, if you're an executive you, and you want to make a lot of on, on your stock options, you can't go work for a company that has a stagnant stock price. And so this would be a classic example of a Buffett value stock that was, um, did not work well. AT&T is another one, PE of about 15. People are always asking me about this one. It, for similar reasons, it's got a very high uh, dividend yield. But then if we drill down and look at the statistics, this is just a highly, highly levered company. Market cap of $209 billion, enterprise value of $385 billion. So they have just a ton of debt. If we look down here, we can see their total debt is almost $200 billion worth of debt versus $10 billion worth of cash. This is a company that has very low returns, low returns on capital. And so what they've done is they've taken on a lot of debt in order to pay, uh, keep paying that dividend. Market is currently pricing in either a dividend cut here or something bad happening where the maybe you make 7% on the dividend yield, but the stock goes down 10%. So you lose you lose 3%. So this would be another example of sort of an old blue chip that's lost its way. And you're actually to get the 7% dividend yield, I'd say if you're if you're investing in anything that has a dividend yield more than 4%, that's not a REIT, you're actually taking on a lot of embedded risk that you don't even uh, don't even realize. Here's another example that someone was uh, asking me about the other day. Uh, Williams Company is an energy company, obviously. We can see it also has a lot of debt. Its enterprise value is way above its, uh, its, its market cap. And if we drill down, let me see what the dividend yield was. I think it's got a, a very nice dividend yield. Yeah, 8%. This is a fake dividend yield. And one way you can see this, you can see that's not sustainable is if you go look at uh, the free cash flow statements, uh, the free cash flow statement under the financial statements. And if we look at what the kind of dividend it's paid for the last two years, it's paid roughly a uh, $1.8 billion dividend to all the shareholders. Its free cash flow has been only $1.7 billion. So this is a company that either needs to raise more equity or issue more debt in order to pay the dividend. It's not. Uh, it's a, almost, you can imagine running a business where you have to pay your investors more than you're bringing in the door. And this is not a, a recipe for a sustainable div dividend yield. And that's why the dividend yield is so high for, well, for WMB. It's pricing in a dividend cut at some point or, or a collapse in the uh, stock price. Something weird going on here with the PE ratio, uh, it's 181. That would be something to dig, to dig into and take a look at. But basically, any stock that's got a dividend yield above 4 or 5% in this environment of 0% interest rates, you really got to understand the company. You got to know what you're getting into. You can't think that you're getting a free lunch. No one ex would invest in uh, a local dry cleaner that's earning uh, $100,000 a year and expect to get a $120,000 a year dividend. 
no one would do that in the real world, but for some reason people want to do it with stocks. So what still works with value investing? Well, obviously the idea of buying a company that's a really strong competitor, that has a strong moat, uh, a wide moat or a big competitive advantage. But in this environment, you can never pay a low PE for it. Maybe if the market crashes intraday, you can get a decent price or a decent PE ratio. But if you want a company with a strong competitive advantage like Facebook, Google, Apple, Amazon, you have to pay a much higher PE. Uh, what else? What else works? Obviously, there's still small deals to be had. So if you bought a house when everyone was panicking in March, if you bought some stocks uh, when everyone was dumping gold, they're dumping treasuries, they're just dumping everything, you can temporarily get something. Obviously, if you're a good negotiator, you can buy a motorcycle that's worth twenty thousand dollars for fifteen thousand dollars. So obviously, buying a dollar worth of something for 80 cents. You can still do this in the real world. You just can't do it in the stock market in normal size stocks. Maybe if the market cap of the company is two or three million, you might be able to do it. But even then, it's not likely. So what does work? What has been working over the last few years? Well, if you've been following my channel, you know that until 2020, I was trading a lot of momentum stocks, what I often call rocket stocks. I have a book about this, a couple books about it. You basically look for companies that have high revenue growth, hitting new all-time highs. Here's the new, the new all-time list, all-time high list right now. We can see Chipotle, Boston Beer, Netflix, Dexcom, some of the companies here. And then you can do sort of trend following or swing trading with it. You look for stocks that are trading above their 50-day moving average, the blue line. The blue line above the 200-day moving average. You can see even for Shopify, this worked really well. Uh, people were able to buy it on a dip below uh, below the 200-day moving average. What I will say though, and one reason I haven't been very active in momentum stocks in 2020, is that when the S&P 500 is below the 200-day uh, moving average line, these things, these stocks, uh, momentum stocks are much more risky. Back uh, last year when the S&P was above the 50-day moving average and uh, the 50-day moving average was above the 200-day moving average, these kind of momentum plays work really well. It's unclear whether we're still in a, a, a bear market now or whether we've transitioned to a bull market because of all the Fed money printing. But these momentum stocks, I would be a little bit, I would be a little bit cautious uh, in trading them in this kind of environment. Uh, if we start to see new highs in the S&P 500 or really new highs on the NASDAQ as well, then these could come back into play later this year. So I'll be taking a look at that. Finally, wanted to conclude with uh, Charlie Munger, about four weeks ago, did a very interesting interview with the Wall Street Journal where the, the interviewer was trying to get some insight into whether Berkshire was buying anything. And as we now know, Berkshire was not buying anything. Instead, they were actually selling Goldman Sachs and selling the airlines and raising even more cash, which is very strange. They may be working on the acquisition of a really big public company, or maybe they'll take Boeing private or some uh, other private company they'll take a big interest in. But I thought the most interesting part of this interview with Munger was his final comment where he said, uh, I don't think we're going to have a long lasting Great Depression. I think the government will be so active that we won't have one like this. But we may have a different kind of mess. All this money printing may start bothering us. Now, this is what I was referring to in the beginning of the interview. The Fed is printing new money, buying up treasuries and junk bonds and munis and mortgage backs with it. And this causes, this ultimately causes inflation. It's a form of monetary inflation. Uh, it makes gold go up. It makes Bitcoin go up. And it can be sort of a mixed bag for stocks. Stocks can go up, but they may not go up as fast as the actual inflation rate. So it's very interesting that uh, this gives me some insight that Buffett and Munger are obviously, they say they're not macro investors. They don't care about the larger economy, but they do. These are, these are very high IQ people. They know what's going on even if Buffett's investment results haven't been that great over the last uh, last 20 years. I think it's very interesting that they are worried about the Fed's money printing as well. So that's why what I've been really focusing on this year is talking about gold and Bitcoin. I don't own any physical gold, but I do own a lot of Bitcoin. And I think Bitcoin is something that does really well in this environment of money printing. Whether stocks go up, whether stocks go down, the Fed is going to need to keep printing a lot of new US dollars, as will all the central banks printing their own currencies. Fiat currencies are being devalued, de debased. 
their purchasing power is going down as, as it always does. And we've entered the point of real scarcity for Bitcoin as well. So very excited about Bitcoin. I would say that's my momentum stock right now. That's my value stock. If you look at the, a lot of the models for Bitcoin, it should be trading in the hundreds of thousands of dollars within the next year or two. Here you can buy a dollar for 10 cents. It's trading under $10,000 per Bitcoin. If you don't have a lot of money, you can buy less than one Bitcoin. You can buy $10 worth of a Bitcoin. Again, none of this is investment advice for anyone else. Just telling you how I see the macro environment. I own Bitcoin. I don't own any gold or gold stocks at the moment. If you found this video helpful, you should check out my online courses. I do talk about Bitcoin and uh, uh, possibly other cryptos later in Follow My Crypto Investments. Financial statement analysis made easy. If you want to learn how to, if you want to um, really develop the skills that Buffett has, you need to be able to learn to read a cash flow statement or a balance sheet or an income statement. Also in this environment, uh, commodities are becoming to look a lot more interesting. So learning to trade futures like a pro is an interesting course as well as I've got a couple courses on how to trade options, swing trading with options, learn to trade options like a pro as well as my flagship course, uh, learn to trade stocks like a pro. Now you, the good news is you don't have to choose between any of these because if you uh, sign up for a monthly membership, a 30 day membership, you get access to all 13 courses. So if you're interested and want to check them out, click the link in the description notes below. It will take you to this page and you can click on any of these boxes to see the list of lectures, to see the curriculum. And if this is something that interests you, you can just click get it now right there. And that will take you to the checkout page. Now currently access, 30 day access is just $125. That gets you access to all 13 courses. But I wanted to give you a coupon code because we're in a recession. So if you click here, have a coupon code and you type in YT, capital YT as in YouTube, 99. Click the update button. That'll take $26 off. Uh, really want to extend this discount during these hard times. I know a lot of people have cash flow issues. But if this is something that interests you and you're tired of binging on Netflix and kind of wasting time waiting to go back to work, or if you have a lot of free time for whatever reason, uh, and you like my teaching style, this is something you can check out. You'll get $26 off. You'll get access to all 13 courses for just $99 uh, for 30 days. And I'm constantly adding new courses. I'm working on a... Uh, a trading robots course as well as a day trading course that I hope to get up as soon as uh, as soon as possible. Hope you guys found this video helpful. If you did, please hit that subscribe or like button and uh, let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. Thanks a lot for listening and I'll see you in the next video.